So why don't you uh, introduce yourself and what you do here at the Global Policy Forum. Okay, uh, I'm Jim Paul, and I'm the Executive Director of Global Policy Forum. And among other things, we monitor the UN Security Council quite closely. We have meetings uh, virtually every week with council ambassadors, and we kind of know what's going on there pretty, pretty well. Okay, so can you kind of give me an overview uh, of the diplomatic process of uh, what happened during the build-up to the war in Iraq? Well, of course, uh, already there had been many years of uh, diplomatic uh, jousting between the United States and the UK on the one hand and most other uh, council uh, missions on the other. The reason for that had to do with the sanctions policy and the sanctions had been in place since the previous war. And so there was a very clear sense that the US and the UK had a very, very special uh, commitment to uh, maintaining the sanctions in spite of all the humanitarian reasons and so on. So what was happening in the build-up to the war was really a continuation of that battle, except in a more, you know, intense manner. Okay. And so um, why don't you uh, describe to me the... Uh, the Bush administration's kind of uh, perspective on uh, the U United Nations and, and, you know, your evaluation of whether or not they really wanted the inspections process to work. Well, it's quite clear that the Bush administration was not interested in working with the United Nations on this. Uh, but at the same time, the Bush administration wanted, as administrations typically do in Washington, to have some sort of uh, fig leaf of international legitimacy. And so when the president came to the UN uh, in September of uh, 2002 and made his uh, sp speech to the General Assembly during the high-level part of the General Assembly meetings, uh, he was calling for UN support for the U U.S. position, which was essentially to uh, have a war against Iraq uh, and to uh, essentially authorize the UN, the, have the UN authorize the U.S. position that uh, there were weapons of mass destruction and that there was, that Saddam Hussein did pose a threat to international peace and security. Uh, so it was that pressure. And the U.S. position was always that um, if the United Nations supported the United States, then the United Nations would actually be effective. Whereas if the United Nations did not support the United States, it would be ineffective and it would be proven to be so. And, of course, this is what they, uh, when they went, eventually went to war, they said the U.S. Uh, <clears throat> is doing what the United Nations should have been doing. And they claimed that they were even uh, enforcing United Nations Security Council resolutions, which was really quite ridiculous. So can you talk about um, who has the authority to enforce those resolutions? The United States claimed that they had unilateral authority to enforce it. Well, only the Security Council has authority to enforce the, regu the, the resolution and to decide on whether or not there was a breach in the resolution. Uh, interestingly, in <coughs> the um, resolution, uh, oh, sorry, I forget the resolution number 14, what was it? 1441. 1441, okay, okay. Hold on. let's, we'll, let's we'll go just, back. Uh, let's take it from the, the top. So, All right. Only the Security Council uh, has the authority to enforce the resolution, and the Security Council must decide whether or not any of its resolutions have been breached and, and what to do. And in the discussion leading up to Resolution 1441, uh, the, uh, the member states that were opposed to the U.S.-U.K. position insisted that it be very clear that that resolution was, did not authorize any automatic uh, military action. In fact, they called this automaticity and they insisted that automaticity not be part of the resolution. And in the U.S. and the U.K. in the statements after the vote uh, and on the record made it clear that they did not consider this to be an automatic authorization. Uh, that was uh, largely forgotten later. So can you talk to, um, you know, one thing that I noticed is Negro Pate also at the same time said there's nothing to prevent us from acting with, to protect our, you know, acting in self-defense. And he said that, that statement and the, the U.S. news media picked up on that as if it was a blank check for military actions. And can you speak to that? Well, self-defense is, uh, of course, allowed under the U.N. Charter. 
but the concept of self-defense in international law is relatively narrow and it doesn't except under very immediate circumstances allow for any kind of preemptive action of this type. Uh, there was this famous case between the United States and Canada where the, uh, going back uh, into the early 19th century where there was evidently some uh, British or Canadian uh, uh, mobilization of forces that appeared to be leading directly to an attack on the United States and the United States forces attacked them uh, this is the kind of thing where an imminent attack is expected. Uh, in order to uh, head that off, uh, the Brits uh, released uh, this um, information uh, claiming that uh, Iraq had the capacity to launch an attack within a very short period of time. I believe it was 48 hours. And uh, this was patently false. And uh, so uh, I don't believe that either the United States or the British government had any, any expectation or belief that there was any imminent threat on them or anyone else, including Iraq's neighbors. OK, 48 hours, or was it 45 minutes? Oh, sorry, it was 45 minutes. Can you just uh, repeat yeah. that? Um, right. and, and talk just specifically on Iraq yeah. and the imminent yeah. threat in self-defense. So. Yeah, the, the idea that uh, there was, uh, under international law, that an imminent threat is required uh, was really not, uh, it, it wasn't proven at all. And when the Brits claimed that there was a 45-minute uh, capacity by Saddam Hussein to strike, uh, including to strike at London, I believe he, he insisted, uh, this was patently false, and uh, I think nobody... Uh, in the international community believe this claim, and it certainly has been proven to be false later. Okay, and one of the, um, the claims of the administration is they never actually, quote, said imminent threat. So can you make the distinction of what the law says from the international perspective and what, uh, you know, the, the administration never actually saying the two words together, imminent threat? Uh, well, I'm not sure that I followed it really that closely in terms of the exact nuances of what was being said here. Uh, in fact, um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure that I'm in a good well, position to discuss speak that. To the, I mean, really, um, speak to the, the question had to do from from the perspective of international law. I think is where the media kind of blurred it. But th there's very def you said there's a lot. I just want to get that again that there's a much narrower perspective of, from international law according to that, like the imminent. The definition of imminent is different from the perspective of international law. Yes, well, the, the international law perspective on uh, and, uh, self defense and uh, imminent attack is that that attack would be something that could be expected almost instantly and certainly within, let's say, uh, 12 or 24 hours, uh, and where the buildup of forces were on a border and all this kind of thing. Uh, that's the notion, uh, and certainly the, not, neither the U.S. nor the U.K. were able to show anything of that kind at all on the side of Iraq. There was no uh, buildup of forces on a border. There were no sort of uh, missiles waving in the air ready to be launched and so on. They knew that perfectly well. They had uh, excellent satellite uh, uh, photography and they had uh, sufficient uh, you know, human intelligence resources in Iraq to know that this was just... Uh, you know, a fabrication. And can you speak to um, the difference of kind of the after the war happened, the administration was using a human rights justification, but before they were giving an entirely different justification to the international community. Can you speak to that? Well, this was important uh, from the point of view of international law because within the UN. Okay, hold on a second. Uh, um, uh, I'm not going to include my voice at all, so yeah. if, if you use any pronouns and it's not clear that you're starting, yes, right. it's going to make sense. So just kind of try to incorporate the question a little bit there. Okay, fine. Um, the, um, let's see, where were we? Um, and, uh, the, you the were question, saying? The, well, the, the, the question was that, what was the question? <laughs> that, uh, yeah, no, like, the, what's uh, uh, my train of thought? It, it was like in Russia. The difference, oh, that's right, right, the difference between, internet, uh, b between the justifications before and oh, after. Oh, right, right, before and after, right. And then, yeah. So, right. Yeah, so, you know, so, just say, right, okay, during, during got the build up to the war, right. you're right. You know. Yeah. 
uh, in the build-up to, to the war, the U.S. administration and the U.K. were using justifications having to do with weapons of mass destruction. And uh, then afterwards, this shifted towards human rights as it became clear that uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction uh, had, were not to be found. Uh, the reason for this is quite clear because within the U.N. context, uh, a sort of human rights-based intervention in Iraq was not at all possible. It had to be based on a violation of existing uh, United Nations Security Council resolutions, and that's what they—that's why they insisted on that so strongly. Uh, it, it's clear afterwards that uh, the um, weapons of mass destruction excuse was something that they came up with in Washington, uh, knowing very well that they couldn't prove that, but hoping that they could insist on it. Okay, and so um, when you say that the human rights justification doesn't fly. Uh, some people would say, well, what about the genocides that he committed 10 years ago? Um, can you speak to that? Well, there's two issues here. One has to do with uh, the um, Saddam Hussein's uh, uh, repression within Iraq and the many people that were killed in Kurdistan and elsewhere. Uh, the reason for doubts about this as an adequate justification uh, are precisely that the United States was his ally at that time. And so the, the notion that somehow the United States could intervene uh, to stop this monster when in fact they were supplying him with uh, uh, coordinates for bombing and uh, intelligence and naval support and arms and even uh, chemical and biological weapons precursors at that time makes the claim that, uh, th that he was a human rights abuser rather ridiculous coming from the United States. He was, however, a human rights abuser. This is true. And there's a larger question there having to do with humanitarian intervention and whether this is a good idea, and if so, who does it, and so on. That's a debate that sort of rages today, and uh, unfortunately that, um, that becomes an excuse very often for the United States to act uh, when it sees fit to do so and is able to mobilize uh, information about uh, genocide or ethnic cleansing and so on, whereas in other cases when the United States doesn't want intervention, it doesn't happen at all. Rwanda is of course the perfect case because there the United States, there was the worst genocide in recent history and uh, the, uh, the United States was not ready, in fact, oppose the intervention of the United, St United Nations and oppose the Security Council resolution that would have allowed that to go forward. And um, can you talk to the, uh, the, the, are there any standards within the United Nations for humanitarian intervention or is it more of a, a blurred line and, um, you know, is it, is that the reason why they didn't use that justification at the international community? Uh, no, they, they, yeah, I think it's true that uh, inter, uh, humanitarian intervention uh, is something about which there's a great deal of debate at the UN right now. But a war on Iraq using that excuse would never have succeeded because of, in, for one thing, the whole history uh, before of sanctions and because of the U.S. Uh, alliance with Saddam Hussein and because of the oil interest that was quite obvious to one and all and so on. So even though Tony Blair has made a specially big effort to, to defend the uh, war as being based on uh, humanitarian intervention, this in, in the view of some of those who like the idea of some, some form of uh, humanitarian intervention have gotten uh, been very very critical of Blair because they feel that he's sort of sullying the idea and weakening it and uh, and uh, discrediting it really by uh, associating it with this particular intervention. Okay, and can you talk um, about what what the actual friend's position was um, leading up to the, the war in Iraq? I think you heard a lot of attacks on France for not supporting the U.S., but they never really got into the substance of what they were actually saying, uh, building up before the intervention in, um, you know, during the time period of from January to March of 03. Well, the French position um, was, of course, opposed to a war at that time. And I think you might say there's two ways to look at the French position. One is to understand that uh, France's uh, position, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, 
Um, I should have turned this thing off. I have to start there. Okay, All right, yeah, we'll go start, again. Um, start yeah. from the top and, and just say uh, the French position leading up to the war in yeah. Iraq was. Right. The French position leading up to the war in Iraq uh, can be seen in two different ways. One is the uh, material interests that were driving France's position that were not entirely dissimilar to those that were interesting in the United States and the UK. That is the primacy of oil, Fr France's big oil company had a big stake there and so on. But uh, France's, view, that, France's own special interest there uh, made its position on the war the opposite of that of the U.S. and the U.K. because they knew that they had a uh, favorable situation uh, for Iraq's oil reserves uh, if the sanctions collapsed and if Saddam Hussein remained in power or if there was some sort of a transition towards another type of Iraqi government that was not dominated by the United States. Uh, at the same time, however, uh, the French, and this does happen in history, um, the French were, because of their particular material interest, also able to defend international law in this circumstance. And they did so actually very, very effectively. They had an, an outstanding ambassador, Jean-David Levit, uh, at the UN, who is one of the best that we've seen around here in a long time. Uh, and, and, the, uh, and able to take on uh, his nemesis, uh, Sir Jeremy Greenstock, the UK ambassador. It was kind of a battle between those two in a funny way, diplomatically, at the UN. Uh, France was um, defending uh, the um, international law in the sense that they insisted that the Security Council have the final say in this and they insisted that there not be any assumptions about automaticity in the council and this kind of thing. Um, they played a very, very active role diplomatically in what I would call neutralizing the pressure of the United States. France brought its own pressure to bear, its own financial resources and so on, enabling the African countries and the Latin American countries to stand up against a huge amount of U.S. pressure that was being brought to bear at that time. And all the U.S. arm twisting and threats and so on uh, were never mentioned in the media, but uh, this was the main uh, background to the uh, debates within the UN Security Council. It was all that, uh, that the, those positions of France that led France to be sort of the hero of the international community, although it's not always the hero by any means. But, uh, so when the um, French uh, foreign minister, Villepin, made his famous statement in the Security Council, uh, and I was there actually at that time, the, the applause that burst out in the council was absolutely extraordinary. I've never sat in the council chamber where there's been applause, and it was spontaneous, and it was against the rules, but uh, almost everyone in the, gal in the gallery was full of uh, other uh, delegations and other diplomats, and uh, it, it, it showed something about the, uh, the, the importance of the French position at that time and uh, not only just defending France's own narrow raison d'etat, but also defending the interests of the international community more generally. And can you, there seemed to be a lot of, um, you know, uh, the, the international community was against, you know, going to war without this explicit authorization and uh, trying to uphold international law. Can you speak to um, why international law matters? Uh, a lot of people in the United States say, why does it matter? Do we just do what we want? Well, international law matters just as uh, national law matters. Law has to do with uh, some form of uh, uh, protecting the weak against the strong, some form of ensuring that regular rules are followed, uh, all this kind of thing. And so law is really what distinguishes uh, you know, chaos and barbarism from some level of uh, you know, civilization and, uh, and uh, you know, something other than uh, the worst kind of uh, human relations. Um, international law, however, is quite different from national law in that there is no sovereign authority. A sovereign authority guarantees that, well, more or less, law is enforced within the national context. Uh, we know that law is not enforced always as regularly as we'd like, that law is in, in the national frame is also reflecting power and all this kind of thing. But uh, nonetheless, 
it does establish a sort of a basic framework of relations between people that is relatively predictable. At the international level, in the absence of a sovereign authority, uh, international law is enforced really by, uh, the, um, by, by the consensus of the international community, by the commitment of various nation states to abide by it, even though it isn't always in their interest and so on. For this reason, international law um, is honored often in the breach. It's not, uh, this isn't the first time that uh, international law was violated and international law tends uh, especially to be supported by the weaker countries and it's the most powerful ones in, in the past as well as the present that tend to violate it because they think they can get away with that kind of violation and, and the United States is unique in terms of its power in the present period and therefore it has a kind of unique uh, interest in and tendency to uh, violate international law and not pay any attention to it. But what's interesting is that the moral authority of international law remains and therefore the United States is constantly in a position where it's claiming to uphold international law while violating it. And it's this kind of contradiction that was seen most evidently during this, uh, the build-up to the Iraq War where the, even the White House with all of its contempt for the UN and contempt for international law had to constantly claim that it was enforcing UN Security Council resolutions, that it was acting under international law, and so on. So I guess the, the problem with the media covering international law is they cover conflict around international law as opposed to the law itself. And so if, if there's no enforcement or authority onto that law, I, I've talked to professors at NYU that say international law doesn't matter. You know, so it, do you... How do you see that, um, you know, that lack of authority um, brings about this excuse of, well, everyone else does it, and so we should just do it as well. It doesn't matter. Well, the media, of course, are not uh, paying attention to international law because the media reporters are, I would say, systematically ignorant of uh, these matters. They, they tend to be systematically ignorant of international legal matters and they're also systematically ignorant of what's happening in a particular country. This is not an accident. Uh, media, uh, the, the, the big media do not assign people on, on any regular basis to these uh, beats. They change them all the time. They, they're interested in people who look good and who have a nice voice and who are good on camera and all that sort of thing and not people who have any serious commitment to learning what's happening. So that's why the, the propaganda system rolls along and they, they, they go to the Pentagon or they go to the White House and they ask what are their opinions about the matter. So it's U.S. authorities who are, who are uh, getting on camera to say what they think about the situation and not anybody who really knows about it. Furthermore, I think there's a lot of professors of international law, unfortunately, who don't have themselves much of a commitment to international law. I'm interested in the, in the shift that's taken place between the generation that included, for instance, Richard Falk of Princeton, Saul Mendelowitz, and others uh, within the international law community in the United States who had an enormous, uh, uh, you know, fiery commitment to the principles of international law. And now we have people like, for instance, Ruth Wedgwood uh, of Yale, who's, uh, who, who have no commitment whatsoever to international law and appear to be just trying to get themselves a job in Washington. This is a, you know, a, a, a shift between um, a period maybe 30 or 40 years ago and today when uh, I, th I would say the United States itself has a different approach to issues of international law and there's much more contempt for it in Washington. So this shows up in international law faculty and, you know, uh, media reporters and writers and intellectuals and so forth because uh, Washington is always influencing those people. Um, so uh, would you, what, why is this happening? Is this um, economic reasons that there's kind of this blurring uh, from all different angles, from the law professor to the media, to the to the point where there's hardly anyone that's aware of the, what you're talking about right now. Well, I think it has to do with. Okay, I'll say, go ahead. Yeah, I think it has to do with a new period 
in the, in the global economy. And this is the period of globalization. Okay, go see. ahead. Just, All right. Just, just yeah. All right. Start from the top. From uh, why? Um, talk to you know why? Why is this happening? This this blurring of international law on, on many different levels. Well, the, I think the blurring of international law in this period uh, is usually ascribed to the U.S. Uh, unilateralism, to the. Uh, sometimes to the Bush administration's own policies, sometimes to the uh, United States as a world empire in the period after the end of the Cold War. And of course, all these factors are part of the mix, but I think it's also important to understand that you have the emergence of a global economy and the breaking down of the borders of the nation states in order that big uh, tr multinational corporations are able to go and invest and uh, carry out their economic activities within those states uh, without any worry about those states enforcing uh, nationalistic or populistic types of uh, politics on them. And so we have the collapse of uh, sort of economic nationalism in this period and the, 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 the battering down of national borders. This is the kind of thing that promotes uh, the need by international companies for some kind of uh, uh, international enforcer of, uh, of what you might call neoliberalism. And this international enforcer, the UN does not uh, suffice for this. And the United States government, with its huge military forces, its capacity to intervene almost everywhere and to threaten uh, national governments with uh, military force if they don't comply, uh, enables the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, uh, international financial institutions and, and, and uh, financial service companies to uh, do their thing uh, without uh, reference to the problematic of uh, uh, nationalistically or, uh, oriented laws and uh, national sovereignty. Um, and uh, I think at the same time we are seeing the development of an international commercial laws, but interestingly enough also international criminal uh, laws of different kinds. The International Criminal Court, although it's opposed by the United States, has taken root. So it's a, it's a very, in terms of law, it's a very interesting period. And the question is, who is the sovereign? Uh, how despotic will, will the sovereign be in this period? Are we going back to the sort of uh, the despotic sovereigns of the early state period in, in the West, which is to say uh, sovereigns like Louis XIV and so on? Uh, or, uh, or is this going to turn out to be a softer path that is going to go through the United Nations? I don't know. And can you talk to, uh, uh, you know, the United States is claiming that it's promoting democracy, and it seems to me one of the elements of democracy is law, and so it, but at the same time, by promoting democracy, they're violating the principles of it. So can you kind of uh, summarize that, that concept and um, uh, if you have any thoughts on that? Well, the United States uh, has claimed uh, down uh, for, for, for many, many years back to the uh, U.S. Uh, military intervention in the Philippines and in uh, Cuba and in, in other countries that it was supporting democracy while it was overthrowing uh, governments uh, um, and destroying the uh, sovereign authority of uh, the people in the in the countries they were taking over. So it's nothing new that the United States is claiming to be supporting democracy when in fact it's doing the opposite of that. The word there's two words that are important here. One is the word freedom, and the other is democracy. And you have a literature that is emerging in the United States where there is a distinction being made between those two. Fareed Zakaria's book, for instance, who's a, uh, the uh, person at the Council on Foreign Relations who's thought a lot about this. Um, and f freedom, in this sense, really means uh, capitalism. It means uh, free enterprise. It means uh, the ability of uh, U.S. investors and U.S. companies to go anywhere and do anything without any government intervention. Uh, democracy is something else again. And Zacharias says 
that we don't want to have too much democracy because that would uh, spoil the spread of freedom, i.e., if uh, individual countries are allowed to be governed democratically, the people may choose to uh, elect governments that may infringe upon the, the, the actions of these international companies and the freedom of those companies and those investors. Uh, so it's this, this, you have the play at different levels. One is the level of propaganda and the, and the, and the other is at the level of, of actual action. And at the, the level of action, it's clear that freedom trumps democracy. Hmm. Um, and it seems like the, uh, the U.S. Me news media, the way they cover um, a lot of these issues is uh, they don't ask why, and th that answer right there seems to explain a lot, but it's not even considered by, uh, let's say, ABC or CBS or NBC. Um, so there's always this sense of, of not getting to the root causes of all these actions that have just been left unexplained. So can you talk about you know, how you know, all these things are going on, but it's not being explained why it's happening? Well, the, the, the television news is organized in a particular way. It's the, the whole world news is, uh, is crammed into a very uh, short space of time. Uh, each story uh, has a very, very short uh, period within that. There has to be advertisements that are, because the news programs are very, very profitable, the advertisers want a certain environment, as they put it, for their advertisements, and so anything that would be controversial or troubling and so on has to be kept out of the news. Uh, I've been on uh, internet uh, on the big national news uh, programs on every one of the major networks and the experience was uniformly dismal. Uh, they came into my office and filmed for a half an hour and at the uh, end of the day when I saw what went on the air it was a sound bite sometimes it was only a few seconds long. Uh, how can any serious matter be discussed when you have sound bites that are increasingly short? I'm told that the average sound bite, even including the President of the United States, is only, you know, uh, whatever, it's uh, 10 seconds or 12 seconds or something like that. And it's, it's been going down every year, I understand, uh, for the last 20 years. So nobody, even the President, can't say anything with any subtlety and that the programs certainly don't want to delve into that. So um, this is a, a very serious problem when it's those shows that are the main uh, way that the public in the United States is understanding uh, you know, international events. And so uh, talk about, you know, how it, it, it seems like there's a lot, there's a lack of imagery as well, and there's a, a whole broad of uh, complexity to international law. So is that also other reasons for, for not uh, covering the international law issues because they're too complex and they don't have images? Well, I think that almost anything can be covered if you want to do that. I mean, images can be found that demonstrate certain things. I think it's true that maybe the images don't jump immediately to mind, uh, but I think the whole mindset of, of news uh, uh, offices are is about what's happening today and because I'm uh, on the air often uh, for instance just last night I was on the air on CNBC Asia and in the afternoon we talked about certain things that that we would be discussing and by the evening the latest news had changed and so they talked about something entirely different what they talked about was driven by what was on the wires in the last hour or so they just simply want to be current and international law just doesn't uh, seem to them to be what is current and that's the way they've been trained uh, both in, in uh, journalism school and in uh, the, uh, their training in the, in the studios and everything else so everything in terms of career building and so on is, is tilting them in the direction of sort of current news, uh, breaking news, what's on the wire and However, we do notice this, that if there is something that the propaganda system determines deserves consideration at length, that does happen. Take the Ronald Reagan funeral, for example. I mean, that was not breaking news for a whole week, was it? And yet uh, Ronald Reagan and the coffin and Nancy and everything 
it was on and on and on and on and commentaries uh, up and down and right and left so they're capable of lengthy considerations but what the things that they consider at length are totally empty or in this case I, I wouldn't say it's empty really because it's about uh, rallying uh, nationalistic sentiment uh, rewriting the history of the United States uh, uh, understanding things uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the days when uh, everyone everything was uh, was right and people felt good about themselves and the US was standing tall all these kinds of uh, notions and images which were totally phony but uh, the, the media decided to, uh, to put forward during that long and agonizing period of coverage. And the one thing that was not covered at all on any of the major networks was when John Negroponte said the words, no hidden trigger or no automaticity. Can you explain that moment on November 8th when he said those words and what did that mean? Well, the, when uh, Ambassador Negroponte made a statement uh, after the passage of the resolution, uh, he did so along with Sir Jeremy Greenstock of the UK, and they did that at the insistence of the other uh, members of the council, the, uh, the, the 11 members of the council that were basically doubting uh, the, the value of that resolution and opposed to the US-UK position. And they, uh, they had already la language in the resolution that made it clear, but they had been uh, forced by the others to make additional clarifications that there was no automaticity and no automatic uh, pr process that would lead them towards war without returning to the council a second time. Uh, all those words were ignored by the media uh, as the run-up to the war proceeded, and nobody said anything further about it as the U.S. Uh, was claiming almost uh, as soon as the words were out of Negroponte's mouth that it had the right and, and indeed the duty to enforce UN Security Council resolutions and that it had authorization under previous council resolutions and so on. The UK took a somewhat different position and there was hesitation on the part of the UK government to uh, go forward uh, until uh, later on. And can you speak to uh, kind of explain uh, their, the legal argument that uh, Resolution 678 and 687 passed in 1990 and 91 actually gave authorization to go to war in 2003. Uh, that's, that's according to the letter that Negroponte sent to the UN on March, 3rd, uh, on March 20th, that that's their legal argument, that they already had uh, authorization from 10 years ago. The Earlier Iraq resolutions, uh, including Resolution 687, uh, certainly did not give them authorization, and they knew it. Those resolutions were about the, uh, the first Iraq war itself, and then the second uh, of the two was about um, uh, human defending uh, human rights in northern Iraq and the issue of overflight and so on. Uh, this was not uh, at all... Uh, about um, uh, authorization to go to war in this period. And those, uh, the, the first of the two resolutions uh, was, uh, had no legal effect uh, after the end of the war. And nobody, no serious international lawyer thought that it did have that effect. And, and uh, people who were advisors to the U.S. and the U.K. governments knew that perfectly well. As for the second resolution, it was, uh, as I recall, it was under Chapter 6 and not Chapter 7. Uh, chapter 7 being required for the authorization of the use of force. Secondly, uh, just yeah. pause for a second. For the, yeah, um, just pick up from... Yeah. Um, you know, the distinction of, uh, you know, that things have to be passed under Chapter 7 in order to even use force. Yes. Uh, uh, it, within the uh, UN Charter, there are two types of resolutions that the Security Council uh, passes. This Chapter 6 resolutions, uh, which do not involve the use of force, and Chapter 7 uh, resolutions that do involve the use of force. And in this case, uh, 
the uh, resolution uh, 687 did not involve, it was under Chapter 6 and not Chapter 7, but also it didn't even, it didn't even refer to the use of force. It didn't uh, refer to anything remotely connected to the, uh, the second uh, uh, war on Iraq. So uh, it was a huge uh, stretch. And uh, I think that these governments just counted on the fact that no one was going to look into it, that uh, people either didn't know about those resolutions or, or weren't going to inquire. The problem was that there were plenty of uh, international lawyers uh, around the world and plenty of people in, in UN delegations who could have answered those questions very easily and very, uh, very effectively, and the media just simply never went and talked to them. So I think you get even... Uh even media professionals now, they would, they have never even thought that this war was illegal. So, in your uh, minds, what is the legitimacy or legality of this war that happened? Well, it's clear that the war was totally illegitimate. It wasn't, uh, uh, it wasn't uh, legitimated by the UN Security Council. It's possible to argue that UN Security Council resolutions after the war gave a certain, uh, you know, very small amount of legitimacy to the war because they legitimized the occupation. That's certainly the position that the U.S. and the U.K. would insist on. However, it's not possible to really argue uh, w within international law that this, that this war was uh, legitimate in any way. It was uh, against the law, and uh, as such, uh, it remains against the law. And uh, most international lawyers who are honest uh, would, uh, would agree with that uh, view of things. And can you talk to, you know, you talk to the, a lot of ambassadors and a lot of different perspectives uh, during this time period. Can, can you give me a sense of what types of things they were, were saying and what their viewpoint might be? Well, in the run-up to the war, the uh, ambassadors at the UN uh, who were on the Security Council and who were critical of the positions of the U.S. and U.K. Um, were uh, really disgusted by what was going on. Uh, I would say that they were, uh, they were clear about the problems of legality that were emerging. They were uh, angry at the pressures that were being brought to bear on them by the United States pressures that were not only on their capitals, but pressures that were brought to bear on the ambassadors at a personal level. And uh, sometimes the ambassadors were even recalled be through this kind of pressure. Um, the, also, there was a fairly clear sense in many delegations, if not all, that, that oil played a big role in this war. And I think uh, in, in, in general discourse in the United States, the concept that this was a war for oil is sort of a very, very tiny minority would insist on that. In fact, uh, it's even considered to be almost uh, impolite to mention this fact. But with that, within the UN, it was considered to be something that was extremely well known, obvious to all. Uh, as for the matter of weapons of mass destruction, uh, everyone around the UN knew that this was a, du a relatively dubious claim. Uh, the first sign that we had that it was an extremely dubious claim came with the issuance of the first UK dossier, which I believe was in September of 2002. And that dossier included a lot of material that was uh, obviously false. I mean, material having to do not so much about weapons of mass destruction because we didn't know whether or not that material was true or not at the time, but uh, material about other things uh, having to do with uh, repression in Iraq and so on. And there was the famous case where um, that, include, that uh, dossier included some material that had been published ten, more than 10 years before in somebody's dissertation, and, and it was uh, immediately discovered uh, I think it was within 24 hours the people in Cambridge University found that out. And we knew then that something was very, very fishy. Uh, but as soon as the UN inspectors went back in, there was an alternative uh, perspective on the question of uh, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, what we, all we had before was information about uh, the 
the, the UN's inspectors uh, prior to 1998 and the fact that the U.S. and the U.K. had more or less forced them to leave uh, as it, more and more evidence accumulated that there was no weapons uh, that, that posed a serious threat at that time. However, the claim that after 1998 Saddam Hussein might have started to rebuild his uh, weapons was something that we couldn't deny at that time. But as soon as the weapons inspectors went back in, the U.S. and the U.K. were then in a position to uh, provide information, as they'd done in their dossiers, uh, mentioning various uh, f weapons factories and all this kind of thing. And Hans Blix and his team and uh, Mohamed al Baradei also um, on the nuclear side went to those places and they found nothing and they had very, very advanced uh, technology that allowed them to find out not whether or not there was something there right then but whether or not uh, uh, chemical weapons had even been stored in the site within the last year or two years because of, uh, you know, trace uh, um, uh, materials that were found in the air and all that sort of thing. Um, and uh, it, it became clear then that really there wasn't going to be anything there and they were looking very, very hard. And so the more that they found nothing, the more the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, souped up their claims. And so around the, within the U.N. community, there was a sense that uh, this was getting more and more false, that it was about oil, that it had nothing to do with weapons of mass destruction, that this had to do with great power intervention. And the ambassadors were very well aware of all this. And so you were, okay, you were at um, Powell's uh, presentation on February 5th. So... Uh, can you describe to me your, your reaction, the reaction of the non-governmental organizations at the UN, but also the ambassadors of that particular moment? Uh, Secretary Powell's presentation in the Security Council in February was uh, seen by me and by, I would say, most uh, NGOs around the UN and by uh, most uh, uh, delegations as a, a media event, uh, patently false, and uh, there was uh, a large group of NGOs that couldn't get into the council chamber. I was lucky enough to be there myself, but the, uh, there was in this building, there was maybe 40 or 50 NGOs that had a closed circuit television, and people were laughing and hooting, and, and uh, it, was, it was obvious that it was just uh, phony from beginning to end. And as I uh, listen to the media today talking about the perhaps there was an intelligence failure and all this thing, and I'm wondering how is it that for me it was perfectly obvious in February and perfectly obvious in January and December that there was no weapons of mass destruction there or certainly nothing that was going to be a threat to international peace and security. And yet, somehow, the, the, the vaunted U.S. intelligence services with their, all their satellites and all their human intelligence capacity and the MI6 with its uh, long uh, presence in Iraq and all the rest of it, that they knew nothing about these things. And how did I know and they didn't know? This is completely implausible. And of course, on the media side, how did the you know, vast uh, news gathering capacity of CBS and NBC and ABC and Fox, how did they miss this when uh, every, every NGO and every um, ambassador and delegate around the UN knew it very well? So if they would have just come here on, say, February 5th or February 6th, they made a, their coverage may have been a little bit different, is what you're saying, in a way. Um, well, they, they, did, they did certainly decide not to ask any, any I'm delegate. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, who? The, uh, the, the, the U.S. media certainly you know, made, uh, consciously or unconsciously, a decision not to inquire about these things and not to come and ask me or ask any NGO who is active and in looking into this matter and not to ask any, any delegate uh, about it. And uh, so they, they, they remained in uh, blissful ignorance, you might say, an ignorance that they decided to maintain about this. Okay. And um, what, uh, hold on a second, let me just see. Okay, about five, ten minutes. The, um, this is a lot of great information. I can tell you that a lot more of what you're saying to me right now is going to not end up on the cutting room floor. Which is, now, um, uh, the, talk about um, 
you know, one article in the Constitution says that all treaties that the United States government signs shall be the supreme law of the land. And is the Charter of the UN a treaty? And if so, can you describe uh, that since we signed it and according to our Constitution, it should be the top law? The, uh, the char Charter of the UN uh, has a special place in international law. The United States, of course, uh, was the principal founder of the United Nations and uh, as such uh, signed that the treaty that called the, in the United Nations into being in San Francisco. It was held, that uh, conference of course was held in San Francisco and the United States uh, really called the shots in a lot of ways and set up an institution they liked. Um, the, United, the United Nations Charter, however, in international law is not just a treaty among many, but a treaty that is, uh, in a sense, higher than other treaties because it organizes international law more generally. Uh, the United States, however, uh, as I understand uh, the way the, uh, Washington treats international law, is to um, take exception to international law and to insist that national law trumps international law rather than the other way around. Um, this is something that you really have to talk to international uh, lawyers about to get the nuances of it, but it's my understanding that they uh, rarely accept, I mean that the Supreme Court would rarely accept uh, the primacy of international law over a domestic law. And I think this is a problem in other, in most other countries, international law and the United Nations Charter would uh, would to predominate, but I think the, the U.S. legal system hasn't uh, uh, doesn't have a good history of uh, recognizing international law. Although international law does play a role in in U.S. domestic law, but I, I don't know the sort of nuances of it. Okay, um, I'll have to check around on that. So, yeah. well, just uh, just summarize that 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 point again. That um, the fact that. The United States is a domestic law trumps international law, whereas in other countries, um, international law is the supreme law. Yes, well, uh, in the United States, domestic law uh, tends to trump international law, whereas in most other countries, international law it dominates over uh, d domestic law. Okay, and let's see. Um, the no fly zones, can you talk to? you know, the legal, legality of the, uh, the no-fly zones, and um, specifically, the U.S. news media would, would never ever question whether or not these no-fly zones were officially sanctioned by the, the entire body of the United Nations, although they, they would imply that it was, or in some cases, just say that it was. Well, that was Resolution 687, I believe, that uh, uh, was... Uh, passed by the Security Council shortly after the uh, first Gulf War. And that resolution, uh, which was uh, passed under Chapter 6 and therefore not authorizing any use of force, uh, nonetheless expressed concern over the uh, human rights condition uh, within Iraq. It was a resolution that was passed in the immediate aftermath of uprisings. Uh, particularly an uprising in, this, in southern Iraq and, uh, uh, and concern on, ab about the uh, safety of the Kurds in northern Iraq. And the U.S. and the U.K. and France decided to unilaterally institute uh, these uh, no-fly zones and to fly over uh, to, to state that uh, a certain part of northern Iraq and southern Iraq could not be uh, used by the Iraqi government uh, as uh, free airspace. And so they uh, patrolled the airspace of those two zones, which covered a very large proportion of the total uh, land mass of Iraq. I believe it was uh, more than half. Uh, and that, that never had authorization in 687 and never had authorization by the UN Security Council. Um, but no one in the Security Council tried to challenge that. The Russians might have done so, but they, the Russians and the Chinese, but because the French were on board in the early period, uh, they dropped out of the enforcement of no-fly zones later on. I think it was in 1997. 
uh, but they participated at a low level uh, in those early years. So it was uh, flagrantly contrary to international law to be uh, flying over and dominating the airspace of a sovereign country, but uh, nobody uh, decided to say anything about it and the, and the practice continued. And uh, can you talk about, um, you know, from your coverage or reading to the New York Times or Washington Post to see how they're covering international law issues, can you talk about the print media and how well even the print media is covering um, these types of diplomatic debates? Well, I would say the print media are better than the uh, major networks, uh, but still... I'm sorry, I'm better at... at sorry, yeah. Okay. The print media are a lot better at covering international law issues than the major networks, uh, but they're still not very good at it. And they still tend to be very, very much influenced by what's happening in Washington and the official positions. I uh, believe the New York Times, uh, as uh, you know, some studies of the history of the Times at different other periods have shown, the New York Times regards itself as sort of a national newspaper in the service of the government. And although once in a while uh, they break out of that, uh, and Watergate was one of the few cases when that really happened, often the, uh, the government uh, will call them, uh, the Secretary of State or somebody, and say, don't run this story, it's against the national interest, and they won't do it. Uh, so they don't see themselves as actually really uh, a watchdog uh, of the uh, of the international interests or, or ordinary citizens against uh, government abuse and so on. And you can see that not only in the run-up to the Iraq War, not only in the international legal issues having to do with sanctions and having to do with uh, uh, no-fly zones and all the rest of it. They just simply weren't covering those things. And when it comes to other U.S. interventions in other places like Haiti and so on, so on uh, they don't give that critical scrutiny either. So unfortunately, you have to be very, very selective if you want to find within the New York Times or the Washington Post the kind of stories that would sort of, uh, you know, help you to understand what's going on. And uh, the, uh, you know, the Bush administration almost changed their position for the need for a second resolution uh, at the end of January. So can you, can you speak to the influence of the uh, UK and the British government on convincing the United States to, to go on to, through the United Nations? Well, the government of Tony Blair was in a very different uh, situation than the government of George Bush when it came to getting a, a second resolution. And the main factor there had to do with the huge opposition within the United Kingdom to this war, an opposition that was not only uh, in, uh, broad within the public at, at a very high percentage, but also uh, was very much within the intelligentsia within the UK. For instance, uh, you know, leading professors of international law and international uh, organization uh, within the universities of Oxford and Cambridge and so forth, these people were all, were all counseling uh, that this was a bad idea. And so uh, the government, therefore, had to proceed much more slowly and cautiously. Indeed, even within the, the, the legal ranks of the government itself, it's generally believed that Lord Goldsmith, the, the Attorney General of the United Kingdom, said that unless there was to be a second resolution, this war would be Ill illegal. And that itself put a lot of pressure on the government, naturally. So it was, it was Tony Blair's need for the second resolution that uh, led to pressures from the UK on the US and uh, clearly Washington eventually decided that they couldn't just ditch the UK and go it alone, that the UK was providing them with very, very important cover in terms of making this look like some sort of an internationally legitimate thing where allies were in support and where the UK mission at the UN with uh, Jeremy Greenstock uh, uh, running interference for the United States very effectively at the UN. All these things were things they decided they had to have. So for this reason, they were ready to come back and make a, a real effort. And I think they thought that they could, when push comes to shove, that they could, they could win because they could put so much pressure on the capitals 
so much threats uh, of every sort that eventually they would prevail. And uh, as you know, they stepped up um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the surveillance of the missions at the UN. As they said, the surveillance, uh, they had bugs in the Secretary General's office. They were able to listen in to even the most private meetings between the uh, opposing ambassadors. All the things that they did, they thought uh, they would prevail in the end, as they had in the, in the first Gulf War uh, final resolution. Uh, and the fact that they didn't was rather extraordinary and said something about the huge amount of international pressure on those governments, pu pu public pressure, and uh, the doubt that many of those governments felt th about the war as an enterprise that would lead to... Uh, just, you know, your but thoughts on that. Yeah, well, it's, but it's, it's sad that there are these professors today, uh, and uh, Ruth Wedgwood uh, of Yale is kind of a notorious example, but there's a number of others like her who are professors of international law but don't think international law amounts to anything and are constantly going around poo-pooing it. And I was on actually an NPR show, and she was on as well, and I said to her, uh, you know, Ruth, you don't really believe in international law, do you? And uh, she sort of hummed and hawed, and eventually she, she essentially admitted that uh, she didn't. And so I wonder, what's the point of having a professor of international law that doesn't even think this thing exists? I mean, it's, uh, if, you, if you were to project this into any other realm, uh, you would see how preposterous it is. Can you have a, um, you know, a professor of... Uh, uh, physics that doesn't believe in physics, I mean, it, it wouldn't make any sense. So it's clear that these people have, uh, have uh, been given these important posts uh, precisely in, uh, for reasons having to do with the, the broad uh, propaganda system at this time in history in the United States. Okay. Did you unplug that? No, I did. Just Okay. Um, now, um, The, uh, um, wasn't Ruth Wedgwood also uh, an advisor to uh, the Pentagon uh, for their legal, or somehow, isn't she advising the legal policies of the United States government? Uh, I, I believe so. I believe, I'm sorry. Yeah. I believe that uh, Ruth Wedgwood uh, was uh, an advisor in Washington, and perhaps an advisor to the Pentagon. So this is the kind of thing that uh, we've seen often in the field of political science, and it now seems to be infecting international law too, where professors, uh, the, the, their highest hopes would be to invite it to Washington to advise uh, the government. And naturally, they're not going to be invited to Washington unless they are sympathetic to the government and uh, understand its pr point of view and share it and so on. So these are, you know, this is one of the many ways that people are co-opted and uh, in, in, but if they were instead to see their role as questioning the government and, and uh, something else again, they would be worthy of their posts and, uh, you know, worthy of uh, some uh, pretense or a reality of intellectual uh, independence. But instead, they're, they're just nothing but flax for, for uh, Washington policy. And talk to, uh, you know, in, in early March, the, um, the London Observer had broken that they had got this uh, NSA memo from Frank Caza, and they published it. And, uh, and talk to, and, and the memo regarding the, the espionage and spying on the other UN. Can you talk about um, when that broke, what, what, uh, what did you think of? you know, this, this revelation that here's some evidence that there's some illicit spying going on and, and what that meant. It, was it even legal that it was happening? Well, it certainly was completely illegal. I'm sorry. The, sorry, the, the, um, the, the revelations about uh, spying by the UK and by the US on uh, United Nations ambassadors and on United Nations Secretary General uh, were uh, pretty outrageous, and they certainly were completely illegal. Uh, illegal in a number of different ways, and illegal within the United States, but also illegal because of the special uh, uh, agreements having to do with the, U with the United Nations and, uh, and its uh, uh, treaty arrangements with the United States uh, to be located here. 
Um, for all these reasons, uh, we were uh, pretty outraged by this, but there was an effort by the media to portray this as sort of nothing new, ho-hum, uh, what else is new, of course uh, this is going on, and so on. And I was interviewed by a number of media who did make this argument uh, to me, and I, I said to them, yes, it's true, if you know about uh, world politics and you know about the espionage uh, capacities of the United States and the United Kingdom, uh, you might uh, not be entirely surprised at these violations of international law. But I said to them, where would you draw the line in terms of violations of international law? For instance, would you be in favor of assassinating ambassadors who sit on the UN Security Council because they don't agree with the United States? And uh, the, um, uh, the two conservative hosts that I talked to on shows uh, s uh, paused at that point. And I'm glad to tell you that they uh, found it difficult on the air to agree that they would be in favor of the assassination of UN ambassadors in that way. So I said, you can see, therefore, that this has to do with the, how one goes about drawing the line in international law and in, in conduct in international affairs. And I said, I draw the line in such a way that, th that is, is completely unacceptable that this kind of thing go on. And uh, so I think that's the only way we can approach this issue. It's, a, it's, it's against the law. It's a violation not only of the law, but also of uh, sort of uh, moral principles having to do with privacy and so on that would exist in any society, almost irrespective of, of whether or not there's, a stat there's, a, there's something on the statute books. Um, but uh, the, clearly uh, this didn't make any difference. And when we found out later on that Claire, from Claire Short, that not only were they uh, tapping the UN uh, Secretary General's office, but they were passing uh, t t uh, complete transcripts of his conversations with various people around in the UK inner cabinet. Uh, this was really even more disgusting. And it tells us something about the you know, utter lawlessness of the, of the United Kingdom and the United States when it comes to any kind of conduct in international affairs. And, uh, of course, the U.S. media once again uh, uh, passed this one by. Right. And so what, and did any of the major networks come to you to interview when that um, story broke? I, I heard that, you know, Martin Bright was a you know, the reporter that broke it and that they had scheduled to have an interview with him, but they just, you know, they canceled it. The, the, during the entire uh, period around this war, both leading up to it and afterwards, the U.S. Uh, major networks never interviewed me once. And uh, I, I, this might not be astounding. They don't interview me all the time anyway. So, But uh, previous to that period, I had had occasional interviews, and I would say most especially on CNN, uh, where I was interviewed, you know, every couple of months or so. And it was quite palpable when that shut down. I mean, it just, you know, the phone from those people wasn't ringing. However, at the same time, it, which was very gratifying, the, the number of interviews that I gave altogether uh, rose astronomically. Uh, and I was giving interviews with the media from all over the world all the time. And in, uh, in uh, 2003, I actually gave... Uh, over 300 interviews. So there certainly was plenty of interest and in media elsewhere, including not only just uh, you know alternative media, but many major media. The big I gave interviews for the biggest newspapers in Japan to major uh, television uh, networks in Germany and France and so forth. And indeed, uh, to the credit of the UK media system, where there was this much more uh, criticism of the United States. Uh, there was, uh, I did give some interviews on the BBC and to the Guardian and so on, but in the United States, nothing. So from, where do you get your news about uh, international affairs? Do you, do you do an audit of international news or do you mainly, do you read the U.S. news to see what's getting out there or do you just get it from the source here? Well, we have a very big website. And it's, one, it's the largest website in the world on the UN and policy here. Uh, and uh, we have maybe uh, 
120,000 visitors a week coming into the site and uh, you know a million plus hits on the site so every week so uh, there's in in uh, posting to that site and keeping it up and so on we're following uh, news uh, very very closely uh, not just news on the regular wires but uh, news in the major media around the world news in uh, uh, that's coming out from various alternative sources and of course our own contacts here at the UN with the uh, um, delegates in the UN uh, uh, Secretariat and all sorts of ways that we're, we're quite wired into uh, to what's happening. Uh, not to say that we don't miss uh, plenty of stuff but we I think uh, and also it has to do with our orientation. Uh, we have a certain sense about uh, things and uh, how things have gone in the past and where they're likely to go. So we're interested in things like uh, natural resources. Are there diamonds involved? Is this oil, an oil issue? Uh, what are the what's the lining up of countries? How's you know we're, we're we 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 have an instinct for certain aspects of the news that the major media in the United States simply never look at. And during the build-up to the war, there was an undecided six. Um, uh, member states of the Security Council. Can you talk about um, those undecided members and uh, you know the tactics and some of the pressure that they were receiving from the United States and the United Kingdom? Well, the pressures we can <coughs> we can see from I'm sorry, yeah the, right just uh, the, set the, up with in the yeah the, right the, sorry the, sorry yeah the um, I'm so used to uh, you know people's voice being on normally right, right. Um, in the in the run-up to the war, uh, the United States put huge pressure on delegations and on capitals to sway their policy, uh, to bring them into, uh, into supporting uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, drive towards war. And this, uh, the Mexican ambassador, uh, Adolfo Zinzer, uh, put it very well when he said that this is a policy of um, bilateralism and by that he meant that the United States would approach each country individually not at a multilateral uh, negotiating level and say to them this business is about you and us and this couldn't be that interesting to you after all Chile you're way down there in Latin America and and Iraq is a very long ways away do you really want to spoil your relationship with us, the most powerful nation in the world? We have here a trade agreement that's, uh, that we're looking at right now, a free trade agreement. And if you guys don't support us on this, we might just have to forget about this trade agreement. They might say to another country, what about the aid package we were talking about? What about the World Bank loans you were expecting? We can veto that in a second. What about our, uh, you know, military cooperation? Uh, and, and what about the investments of U.S. firms in your country that you were hoping for? We can, we can nix that in a second. So there's so many ways. And, and as Ambassador Zinzer pointed out, too, the, um, the United States is able to influence uh, elements within that are influential in the domestic political scene. For instance, in Mexico, the U.S. ambassador went around talking about how terrible it was going to be for Mexican business interests if Mexico didn't have a friendly relations with the United States over the Iraq matter. And so therefore, a number of conservative newspapers and television stations and so on, uh, elements that were part of President Fox's own coalition, started howling about uh, how um, the support for the United States wasn't sufficient and how opposition to the Iraq war was a big mistake. So you had, a, you had this split then domestically between the vast majority of people within Mexico who were opposed to this war and the sort of business interests and other elites who, who were beginning to put pressure on the government. So this is the bilateralism uh, methodology that the U.S. was using in every single case. And all I can say is it was a miracle that they failed. It was absolutely wonderful and it had something to do with the uh, pressures by France and the diplomacy of, and also 
the deep sense, I think, by those governments that this was a terrible mistake, that it would end up in uh, destabilizing the world in ways that would actually affect their own international interests. And so, for all these reasons, they decided to opt for um, um, some, uh, a little storm in their relations with, the, with Washington. Uh, and uh, and uh, then they, 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 they continue to hold out. And this, a lot of the stuff that you're, you're talking about is, it seems that stuff that I've heard for the first time, partly because of the media is only is so centered on what's happening within our own states. Can you talk to the, that phenomenon of how the media is only focused on what's happening within our borders and regardless of what's happening in other countries? Well, the media is uh, mostly focused on what's happening in the United States and they, for, for uh, information, they go first to Washington and the president or the Pentagon or whatever, perhaps the Congress. And there's a particular culture within the Beltway that excludes uh, uh, most, uh, you know, international considerations. But I would say that it's uh, in in doing this, they 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 are able to um, to benefit from uh, a uh, a sense of intellectuals within the United States more generally that the United States is a sort of self-referential. And unfortunately, in universities and in even uh, magazines of opinion uh, to the left of center, I would, re for instance, refer to the Nation as an as an example, where often uh, U.S. Uh, um, centric interpretations of what's happening uh, are uh, win out over a broader international sense. Uh, to give you an example, I think uh, domestic policy issues within the United States cannot be referred to without an understanding of the broad international economy and what's going on. For instance, homelessness is always referred to in terms of what did Reagan do, what was the policies of Clinton, how did it happen, and all about Washington. And sometimes when I talk to people about these things and I say, but yes, but homelessness increased in the United Kingdom and in France and in Germany at this time. How do, you, how do we understand that when maybe there was a social democratic government in place in one of those countries? It wasn't just Reagan or Thatcher. And very often serious policy intellectuals left of center in the United States, their eyes kind of open wide and they say, well, gosh, I never thought about that before. So. I think that uh, we, we certainly need to uh, fault the media for their failure of responsibility, but I think we have to realize that this is deeper and broader, and it has to do with the size of the United States, the fact that people only speak English, the fact that, you know, until relatively recently, you know, very, relatively few people went out there in the world and knew about it, and even now they, they pop, intellectuals pop across the pond to a conference and they come right back and they don't really know much about what's happening. I mean, it's, it's very, this is very deep. And the fact that President Bush had, ver ver I think, been outside of the United States once or twice uh, before being president was, alas, uh, you know, not so, such a you know, rare exception, but all too common uh, among uh, members of Congress and, uh, and others in the United States. And the, all this that you seem to be talking about seems to be that both the Democrats and the Republicans and the media have this blinder on uh, to, own, to not even consider any of the, the cost. Or the, the, they always talk about the benefits of capitalism, but never the costs of um, these capitalist policies, globalization and what sort. So can you speak to that a little bit of uh, how those blinders on those three institutions, uh, of the Democrats, Republicans, and, and the media, kind of resulted in this coverage building up to the war in Iraq? Well, um, the... Uh, Democrats, Republicans, the media, intellectuals uh, are all very blind to what's happening on the, on the world scene. Uh, I think that there are certain pockets of interest uh, that have to do with um, um, international policy think tanks and the like that we find in Washington that uh, interest themselves in these things. But if you look even at the uh, progressive uh, uh, approaches, for instance, foreign policy in focus, which uh, I, 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 I hesitate to knock because they do often very good things. But if you 
read their mission statement and if you read their discourse, it's all about making a better uh, U.S. policy. And therefore, it's all centered on the United States of America and its policy and its you know, so-called leadership in the world, as opposed to rooting it in, in an international reality and the interests and needs of you know, the six billion people on the planet. And if you start to think that way, uh, you stop saying we when you talk about the United States government and you start thinking about we as being the peoples of the planet and then things take uh, you know a very very different turn unfortunately the in the battles between uh, electing uh, the latest uh, candidate for president and getting senators in office and you know seeing these elections as being the the, the end of the world and uh, earth shattering um, the, you can't believe that it's that in, in that and also at the same time have a perspective on the world that, see, that puts uh, U.S. policy uh, in, 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 a, in a global perspective.